quickly I'll quickly uh, introduce Eric and Lauren. So Eric is an old friend of Taishing and also a very familiar face of Davos. And he probably has come here for more than 20 years. <laughs> and I remember Eric usually, <laughs> and you remember often meeting him after he does uh, country, cross country skiing. And, uh, and that's a very good thing to start a Davos trip. Yeah, that, that's true, but we'll switch to hiking. Um, Eric is the, uh, uh, currently the first chief economist of Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, AIIB, and they do, they do lead uh, many of the green projects, not just in China, but in uh, Asia in general, we'll hear that shortly. And Lauren is, uh, Lauren Sorking is executive director of Resilient City Networks. So speaking of the uh, alliance and collaboration among the developing world, I think Lauren knows a lot about how to put different stakeholders in the same room and convince them this is the way going forward. So Eric, could you, uh, uh, can we start with you and sharing with us um, what is the ESG or the green related efforts from AIB and how do you see the carbon markets, since we're gonna talk about carbon markets in the emerging countries, how do you see that evolving? Well, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to, to this session. And, and uh, I had, Expected a slightly different conversation, but I, I, I think we we'll probably get there at some point. Uh, talking about uh, how to connect um, different uh, carbon exchanges, and uh, which I think is, is extremely important, and and something that uh, if we can be part of that, that would be great. So, yeah, very briefly on AIB, it's a it's a um, six year old institution now. The, it has uh, 109 members. Uh, India is our largest uh, single uh, client. Uh, we are very much in the climate space. Our objective is to be 50% climate by, uh, more than 50% climate by 2025. And, um, you know, so, you know, a lot of what we are doing so far has been focused on individual investments so working with individual uh, clients um, in, 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 the, in the climate space. I think increasingly, and of course, that's also, I hope it's gonna be my role to be part of developing also the, the sort of policy side and, and uh, you know, making sure that these go hand in hand. And of course, as, as we become more important as an, an investor, we hope, hopefully we will also be able to, to be more impactful in, in the policy space. But, and I think it's, it's so critical in this, to, when you talk about these issues that they have to, to, to work together. And, and of course, if you're setting up a, a metaverse um, green exchange, uh, of course, you know that you have to be recognized by the uh, authorities and you have to, uh, you know, it, it is a uh, very important um, exchange to be had. Uh, so so I, I said a few things about the ESG in Asia in, 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 the, in the previous session here, but uh, I think, a, so Asia is, you know, and I would say probably the emerging world in general is a little bit behind. Uh, we had um, uh, some conversations uh, in, the, in the intermission here about about that. I think it's uh, on the one hand, it's um, you know very understandable. Uh, most of these countries were not have nothing to do with the, the problem that has uh, emerged, and and uh, they felt that you know their growth being constrained for uh, something that they were not part of uh, is clearly unfair and, and uh, we, we shouldn't forget that. And, uh, but I think they're increasingly recognizing that this is something that cannot be stopped and they don't want to be part of or slowing down because they're seeing the impact that the climate is having, you know, certainly in, in, in China, certainly in India, but you know, all over, uh, you know, climate is already uh, upsetting uh, the lives of, of, of many uh, people and, and individual economies. So, so uh, what I think is, uh, has been happening in this discussion from a sort of emerging economy perspective is that, and, and we are, by the way, you know, I think we are the only sort of a global institution where emerging countries have, have a majority of, of, uh, of, uh, of the votes. And, and that's, so we see this particular role in, in trying to engage uh, with the emerging world and, and, and be a sort of a voice for the emerging world. So when you see what, what has happened, if you look at what happened in, uh, in, in Glasgow, there's a shift away from this saying, you know, we. We don't. Uh, we want to develop first, and then we can start dealing with our sustainability issues. It's much more about you know we need to get you need to help us uh, get the resources that are needed, and and the technologies uh, that are needed to 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 be part of this uh, journey. And and if I say one thing that I want to be part of, of at AIB is to try to in, in a small way contribute to making sure that 
no countries are left behind in, in this climate uh, uh, um, yeah, effort. So, I, you know, I could speak, you know, a long time about it, you know, as, since I spoke about uh, um, ESG uh, in the previous session, there was one thing that I didn't bring up that I should have brought up, which I think is very important. When you look at how these ESG measures are applied now, I would argue that they're very discriminatory against emerging and developing economies. And, and we need to get away from that. We need to think about the way that is more um, inclusive and, and, and does recognize the differences in, in economic structures and so on. And, and it's not only that they are discriminatory, a lot of uh, major institutional investors do not include uh, emerging economies explicitly. And, and that is, I think, also something that we have to, to fight. And there is a, there's huge uh, opportunities to, um, for emerging economies to contribute. And uh, I, the first uh, report that I was part of producing at, at uh, AIB was uh, uh, on the global value chain. So, and of course, it was triggered by what we've seen in the global value chains in, in the pandemic. But really what we started, when we started realizing or, or looking closely at these global value chain, what's really going to be completely transformational for them is uh, the decarbonization and the pressures to, you know, at each step of the value chain, look for opportunities to decarbonize. And the pressures are enormous from, you know, from the financial sector, from uh, civil society, you know, from uh, also, I think a lot of people don't want to work in organizations that, that don't uh, um, uh, respect, uh, you know, the sustain sustainability issues. So, so those, you know, the um, uh, looking at these global value chains and looking at the increasing role that emerging and, and developing countries are playing in these global value chains, you know, I think there we have a fantastic opportunity because, you know, what, what really the basis of this uh, global value chains is the ability of individual firms, the lead firms in this value chains to enforce standards uh, along the value chains. And, you know, it's, maybe it's today it hasn't been all about uh, decarbonization, but they have the potential. That's what the, the basis of their competitiveness and why they have been so successful uh, is the ability to enforce standards. You know, if we can work with lead firms to, to do this, it's going to be, I would argue, the most powerful mechanism we have for enforcing uh, decarbonization across countries you know with these we have a lot of you know peer pressure and those things but this is, is as we see it's not powerful enough we need some you know that need to be real implementation and here i would argue that the global value chains are, are, are very much part of that we i, I had a op opportunity to to talk about this report to uh, the all the finance ministers of the arab world and of course the arab world has been you know very um been very difficult for them to come into these global value chains. But when I spoke about the, the, the opportunities now, because of if you can offer decarbonization opportunities, that is a huge uh, possibility to attract uh, uh, global value chain investment. And you know, as you know, many of these countries have made massive in, in investments in, in solar, in wind. And so look at what Egypt has done, look at across all North Africa, for example, you know, massive investments this could be part of the beginning of building something new in these countries. So I think the climate is not just a, a burden, it's also a lot of opportunities. And that's what I want to emphasize. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And we'll come back to a lot of the points you pointed out, but let me turn to Lauren first. And Lauren, introduce to us what Resilient City Networks does and how you see the change of awareness or capacity or how they would be likely to reacting to the problems Eric just pointed out. Hopefully you can hear me well. Um, I have a loud voice. Uh, so I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for, for having me. And I guess I, I just want to acknowledge that there's a lot of uh, familiar face in the audience, Karina Tan from, from Tomasic and other friends. Um, it, it's it's great to, to be here and to be speaking about this issue and specifically to speak about ASEAN and the opportunity that, that's, that's there. And I don't want to walk away from that, but also to acknowledge the two of us are obviously not native to ASEAN. And I hope that in the future, one of the members of my team from Indonesia or India uh, will be sitting here in my place. Um, but I, I do want to talk about really this, this moment moment, right, that we're having right now, because we've come out of COVID, we, we are recognizing the climate crisis, and that's really emphasized that we have to build resilience to different kinds of shocks and stresses. And that kind of capacity has to be built over time, and it has to be built with incredible attention to equity. 
And I think that those are a lot of the points that Eric was making. Um, he was specifically talking about kind of climate equity and climate justice, but it is quite a bit broader than that. I mean, if you look at this rarefied space that all of us have the privilege to, to be in, and you think about what's happened over the past two years, um, you know, the, the richest 10 people in the world doubled their fortunes while 99% of humanity's incomes were reduced, right? And you have, you know, 1% of the global population, we all know these statistics, who control 35% of private wealth. That's part of why we're here is because we want to tap that and we want to channel it for good, right? But at the end of the day, there is a basic set of principles that we have to work towards and to democratize to democratize the access to solutions, right? And technologies is a really big part of what we have to do. So just, just to put a finer point, I guess, on, on, on resilience and why we have to build this kind of integrated capacity. When we look at Asia and the Pacific, 98 of the 100 most vulnerable cities to climate and geophysical impacts are in Asia and the Pacific, and they're mostly coastal cities, right? And we have over 55% of the population in Asia Pacific living in those spaces, more than 2.3 billion people, right? And those are people who need to be protected adequately. So we need to work on working towards net zero, but also working towards safe and equitable outcomes. So what Resilient Cities Network does is we work with our city members. We have over 97 of them uh, around the world in five regions, including 21 in Asia and the Pacific. Um, we build their capacity through tools and training and putting an officer in government who then looks at that long-term planning and helps to prioritize that. Um, I have the privilege of being the executive director of the network, and we actually moved that network, um, and Corinna knows the story very well, from New York, where it was founded almost 10 years ago, to Singapore. And the reason that we did that is because there is no other global network of cities that is based in Southeast Asia, despite the fact that it is the fastest urbanizing region in the world. So you combine that high vulnerability with the fact that about 50% of the infrastructure that we need in urban areas in Asia and the Pacific hasn't been built yet, right? It's why we need institutions like the AIB to keep growing so quickly and working with the private sector, because we actually have a once in a lifetime opportunity to build better. And people keep talking about build back better. I'm like, no, 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 no. Let countries who are building back build back better, that's their responsibility and they're putting in policies for net zero. Countries that are building for the first time, right? And upgrading from slum areas to sanitation, piped water, affordable housing, right? This is our opportunity to do something very meaningful that is both low carbon and safe. And in order to do that, we have to share knowledge. I think I agree very much with the speakers before, Michael and with Majun, that the solutions are there, but we have to very rapidly accelerate the investment in those solutions. And we have to actually change the expectations we have about how much profit we're gonna make about those solutions. People don't like to talk about it. And we all talk about impact investment and making 8% on all of your new returns because everyone wants to find the new climate unicorn, awesome. There are definitely some of those out there, but there's a lot of hard work that needs to be done in public infrastructure. So we, we prioritize working with cities, providing that kind of capacity in the cities so that when amazing investors and solutions and technologies go out, they have a sparring partner in the cities. So I hope I can leave it there to start and we can go deeper. Lovely, thanks. That's very fascinating. And I see people nodding and thinking and we try to make this as interactive as possible. So whenever you want to stop by, make a comment, make a question, raise your hand, jump in. We'll have a phone, have a microphone or you can just speak loud. You know, we can hear that as well. So everyone talks about, uh, um, I think uh, the previous panel, they talk about what the global leaders can do. And just now Eric and uh, Lauren shared with us the practitioners can do and provide the solutions on the ground. And Eric said about, talk about the uh, discriminatory system against developing countries and Laura talked about that too. But where's the starting point? I mean, we need knowledge, we know we need financing. So which are the, uh, the, the, the early, maybe there are low hanging fruits we can start immediately? No, I, I think the thing that people are extremely aware of, and, and particularly in these uh, vulnerable cities, is I think they are becoming aware of their vulnerability. But the first thing they see uh, I, in most cases is the pollution. And, and uh, certainly, and we talked a bit about this in the previous session, the, if I look at 
you know, the change in mindset in, in people in, in Asia, and, and that goes for, I think, ASEAN as well. It's really the, the you know, it's go, if you think about Indonesia, which you think about certainly what's happened in, in India, what happened in China, you know, the environment was the kind of wake up call. And, and, and uh, we should build on that because it is extremely closely related. By the way, it's not only in, in the emerging world. I mean, I can tell you, in, I used to live in London and, you know, the London, you know, it's not polluted in the same way as, as India and, and as, as Delhi or, or Beijing, but, but it is a, uh, you know, it was a wake up call for many people when we realized that there were, you know, 20,000 uh, excess deaths because of, of the pollution in London. So, you know, these are, these are things that we, that's, I think, where we should start. I mean, and, and of course, as you said, you know, these, uh, what is particularly difficult to get going is the adaptation, you know, the, all these uh, investments that are needed to, to protect individuals because they are, they are not global public goods typically. Sometimes they could be regional public goods possibly, but a lot of this is about private goods. It's about, you know, what I do as an individual or what a company does, or maybe sometimes what a city does to protect itself. But um, how do we get those going? And, and it's very difficult speaking as a, as a sort of development uh, banker, you know, when there, there are no revenue streams often with these, uh, with these investments. So how do we build them? And, and it goes for a lot of other things in the climate space, the nature-based solutions. How do we get um, uh, revenues that we can use to, to uh, structure financing? Is, 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 that's a, a very real cha challenge. I want to pick up on a couple of points that, that Eric made. I think in, in terms of where we, we start, I think we need to use a much more common set of principles for deciding where we're working. And a lot of that data is readily available. I remember when I started working at the, the Asian Development Bank in 20, well, 2008, we used to have to go uh, and ask the Australian colleagues at um, CSIRO <laughs> for downscaled climate modeling to, to get the best models for working um, in, in some of our projects. And now a lot of that data is available regionally and it's available in much greater detail. And the power, right, of our, you know, <laughs> computing, the power of shared data um, actually allows us to prioritize investment areas. So I think we can actually be a lot smarter about where we're directing the investment so that we're protecting vulnerable populations. Um, you know, our, our colleagues in small island states, right, really do have an existential threat and we need to really look at where we have to do managed retreat and where we have to do different kinds of building. That's a, that's a big issue um, for, for our small island states and even for um, some of our archipelago states. So I think we need to use good data and share definitions of how we prioritize investment. I think the other thing is we have to have a much more mature conversation about the finance right? The insurance sector is a very natural partner, right, for this kind of work, um, because number one, they have a lot of risk models. <laughs> number two, they have an interest in avoided losses. Um, and I think that when we think about structuring the returns, and obviously development banks are very forgiving, very low interest rates, very long term, um, these are good partnerships. I think the role of blended finance has a lot um, to do in this in this space um, is actually providing those longer terms for investment and also reducing the cost of capital on the best types of investment. Thank you, thank you. And um, thanks, a uh, welcome to here, Professor Stiglitz. <laughs> Joe, thanks for making it. Yeah. And uh, we'll continue the conversation. Now I'll turn to uh, Joe in a minute. Um, finance is one very important part, but also we heard from last panel that technology provides a lot of solution and most of the technology are ready. Why can that be transferred to uh, ASEAN countries? Well, um, <laughs> I think when we talk about climate readiness, we talk about resilience, you know, all resilience is, is local, right? Your, basically your, your risk, right? And, and your capacity, right? Is gonna tell you whether or not you're gonna be able to absorb a shock right, or a stress. So you know, there are a lot of technologies that are available, but there has to be kind of that last mile implementation support for a lot of these things. I am extremely hopeful, and we're gonna talk about the metaverse, right? I am extremely hopeful about the possibilities for us to use technology to actually extend the way we transfer 
technology. Um, I do think that there's an incredible opportunity where we used to have to organize, you know, study tours and think about logistics and health and safety for us to do a lot more of that through virtual knowledge sharing and through expertise. I think that there's also, <laughs> I think that there's also a need to think about scale hub and spoke models in emerging, in emerging markets using state and provinces that are in particular vulnerable that we do know have the capacity to take a solution and then share it with, um, with the neighboring cities around them. And that one example uh, that we're, we've been working on for quite some time is in the state of Gujarat in, in India. I know that's not in ASEAN, but <laughs> not so far out of the neighborhood. And um, in, in Surat, they have a very common problem to many cities who are you know, climate um, challenged in the region, which is that they have a massive river that runs through the city. Um, it's a highly polluted river because Surat produces, a lot, for those who are familiar or not familiar with Surat, a lot of the garments for India and for the world. Um, they also cut a lot of the diamonds, but that's a different conversation. Um, and so what Surat has done is they have looked at a complete adaptation plan around Tapi River and also a comprehensive change for the industry that reduces emissions. And they've now shared that experience through the state level to eight other cities uh, in Gujarat state. So I think in terms of appropriate technology and getting the message out, we can work very closely with different governments and the private sector together to then localize and scale. Maybe a, a couple of comments. I actually was fascinated you brought up Gujarat because um, actually, um, so one thing that I've tried to foster at, at AIB is to be to build a, a geospatial uh, data platform, because I think a lot of this is going to be a lot of the issues that you spoke about is going to be dealt with through geospatial analysis. And, and so we did our AIB did its first completed projects was a, a small roads project in a rural road project in Gujarat. And I don't know if you, those who follow the, the discussions about um, the, the, the investments in roads and, and that's a you know, very well uh, established paper uh, lo looking at the sort of high level roads in India and they show that very little impact on, on development from these investments and people sort of wonder you know uh, whether this could be really true so we looked at these uh, uh, rural roads and and there have been a you know major program uh, in in Gujarat and what we could show that actually what was why they were so significant were that they brought exactly that last mile connectivity and, and realized the potential of these higher level roads. So, you know, by, by uh, doing this, um, uh, building these uh, small roads, people could, uh, you know, start benefiting from, you know, uh, more job opportunities, better health, better access to education and so on. So just a, a kind of side, side remark to it, since you brought up Gujarat, but I think that the really exciting possibility there is now to, layer on top of that uh, climate related uh, uh, data climate and and you know uh, 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 climate vulnerability uh, uh, also data on, on top of that but i actually want to go back to something we we spoke um, uh, about before because um, you know when we uh, when we talk about access to to technology for for countries it's it's actually it's a lot about standards and what i see really changing in asia now and i can say speak from it uh, from my you know sitting in, in Beijing uh, the, um, the, the the thinking has completely changed it used to be that you know you work with local standards and you deal you you, you do infrastructure projects according to local standards. we shouldn't impose any standards on, on countries I think that it was probably well intended but what was clear it didn't work because you're putting in place you know inferior technologies, you know, that will be with you for 20, 30, 40 years. And, and you know, it's not in the interest of those countries, it's not interesting of, 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 of the um, global system. We need to ensure and, and, and of course, provide the financing and the, the support, but we need to get the, the state of the art. Uh, of course, it has sometimes, it, you know, you don't always need, you know, uh, the, 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 the most uh, sophisticated technology, but, but you, you need uh, you know, sufficiently good technology that can work in, in, in these uh, environments and, and really focus on, on the impact you're having on what you're trying to, to address. If it's about reducing the carbon footprint, you, we should, that should be the focus 
of, of when we think about technology. So, so that makes me very hopeful about the possibilities in, in Asia that this is actually changing dramatically. And also, if you look just on, on uh, we, are, we don't have any uh, uh, involvement in the Belt and Road Initiative, but I'm watching it from the side. And, and you can see how that is also changing, that the, the, the quality of, of investment becoming much more important. Private sector involvement is becoming much more important, and and really looking at how we can raise standards. My, my the neighbor in my uh, in my um, uh, in, in the office is actually something called the multilateral um, center for development finance, which was is an initiative of six countries at the moment, and it's all about raising standards. It's everything, and they started you know with actually debt um, uh, transparency and, and and trying to get greater transparency around. That of course this is a big issue, but it also looking at climate uh, uh, transparency, looking at measurement of carbon footprint and so on, climate smart connectivity. So I think that's a lot of new thinking, luckily in in Asia that we can uh, make use of. I kind of pick up on that with um, a, a fear and then maybe a hope. <laughs> um, as, as I say to my daughters when they call me to, from Singapore to, to tell me what's happening there, always bad news first, then tell mommy the good news. So. Um, one thing that concerns me is that we have phenomenal global standards and conversations, right? And World Business Council for Sustainable Development and this forum and many others, COP26. Um, but when we talk about who's winning most of the projects on the ground in developing Asia, these are local actors, local construction companies, SMEs, um, who don't have the capacity nor the incentive to do things differently. Um, and these are mostly in secondary cities, right? That are, that are emerging quickly or even smaller cities than that. And they're gonna build this infrastructure once and then it's gonna last for 20 or 30 or 50 or even 80 years. So that, that's a concern. <laughs> I, I think a hope on the flip side of that is that we quickly figure out how to share the incentives to do things better. And we were debating a little bit about this at lunch in terms of what we think about when we think about what emissions belong to a national grid or a country and what emissions belong to companies and, and how they can trade those. Because even for, um, and I had the privilege of sitting in on the real estate governors meeting at the WEF um, was yesterday, um, even for the biggest players, they will say openly, there are lots of sticks <laughs> and not a, lot, not a lot of carrots. So if they are feeling that way <laughs> about real estate development, and we know that over 90% of investment in cities is happening from local actors, then what are the smaller guys saying and gals, right? They're saying the same thing or even, even worse. You know, they're gonna just try to get the deal, right? Which is normal, that's, that's business as usual. So we have to figure out, and I hope we will quickly figure out how to localize and share benefits with actors because I don't know, a leader of any company or a mayor in any of the cities that I've ever talked to that says, I don't want to meet net zero. <laughs> I don't want to keep my citizens safe and increase equity. Of course they do, but they need help to figure out how and they need resources. Thanks. And I saw Ling Hai was wanting to contribute from Lai and then uh, Rui Hua. And then we'll invite uh, Professor Stickless to give us a special remark. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, my question is, I just want to pick on the equity point. My question is really about the cost of clean energy. I mean, I think poor people or low income people, they don't burn coal and, and, and burn wood because they like to smell the smoke or the bad air. It's because that's what's affordable, right? So how do we not let this also get into this, uh, uh, become another nail in the coffin or exacerbation of the, the massive divide that is, it becomes a luxury. A green energy is a luxury for the rich because they can afford it. So how do you? How do we know we're able to bring down the cost to a level where this is, can be afforded by all before we dismantle the traditional carbon infrastructure and everything else? And that I I, I heard this in Singapore, which I think is a very valid point because you're reducing the investment in the traditional energy um, production. But, but the scale and the efficiency really have not come to fruition for non-carbon based uh, green energy. So I feel like there's a disconnect here. And I, I would love to hear your views on this and what it takes to really get there. 
fundamentally, I, I'm a businessman. I believe nothing is sustainable if it doesn't have a, a good revenue or profit model, right? You, you just can't expect goodwill to be the driving force behind all of that. So maybe this is a, a place where I should uh, <laughs> uh, intervene. So, uh, oh, okay. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, what's happened to energy markets uh, in the last 10, 15 years is very dramatic. Uh, renewable the price of renewable energy has really come down to be more, it's really competitive with uh, old uh, technology, you know, fossil fuel uh, technologies. And uh, one of the things, uh, you know, even though the sun is not totally reliable as we see here in Davos, it's more reliable than Putin. And, <laughs> and, and uh, one of the things that uh, we know, uh, you know, economists have studied, uh, Eric, is, you know, things called the natural resource curse. Uh, a very large fraction of the fossil fuels are controlled by authoritarian uh, figures. And so if you are dependent on fossil fuels, you'll get uh, uh, the fossil, the oil crisis of 1970s uh, and uh, the Russian crisis of, uh, of, of, of today. So uh, you, I, when I walked in, you were talking about resilience and, and part of resilience, I think, is moving to renewables. Um, so it's both cheaper and more, uh, more resilient. Um, one remark uh, I wanted to make that was um, a little bit uh, uh, related to what Eric was saying. Um, there's been a lot of debate about whether developing countries, emerging markets should be given uh, more leeway in meeting uh, climate change targets. Uh, you know, I've been a little bit critical of China saying we're going to be carbon neutral by 2060. Uh, I said, why not 2050? Uh, my view is that uh, it's a disadvantage for developing countries and emerging countries to move slowly because you, you know, all the technologies you're talking about are, and investments are 20, 30, 40 year investments. Why would you want to saddle yourself to investments in technologies that are so uh, 19th century rather than 21st century? You know, in other words, uh, you it, there's a big advantage of being part. You know, your uh, say China is growing so fast. You have the opportunity to put in the most advanced technologies and really to be at the forefront of uh, where all the technologies are. So, and, and uh, one of the things that uh, we've learned is uh, you learn about technology by investing in technology. And, you know, if you don't invest it, you don't learn. One of the reasons why the United States uh, was shown to be so lack of resilient and uh, COVID-19, why we weren't able to produce even simple product like masks is because we stopped producing it. Once we stopped producing it, we lost that knowledge. And so if you start produce, you start using, and I, I call, there's learning by doing, and we call it learning by using, learning by investing, uh, you uh, get a competitive advantage. Uh, Korea became the most efficient steel producer in the world. And it didn't do it by studying the textbooks on steel producing. I don't know if there are any textbooks <laughs> on steel producing. What they did is they said, we want to be an industrial country. And the only way to become an industrial country is to become an industrial country. And so they asked Japan to, to build uh, help them build a steel factory. And then they took that and got better and better and better and better at it until the point where they were better than any other country at, at that moment in uh, steel production. 
So um, I, my, my feeling is that there are big advantages to being ahead of the game. Now, you know, there is always the question, you know, as I was walking over here, we're going to talk about finance and, and the how do you finance is that's, that's another issue. And, and this issue of, of uh, you know, blended finance using, using, uh, 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 some, uh, lower cost finance and blending that with private sector finance. And, you know, there, there, are, there are a whole set of financial issues of how you could organize the paying for it uh, that are uh, not trivial. Uh, but uh, in terms of, of strategy, business strategy, it seems to make uh, the most sense to, to try to be as much ahead of the game uh, as one can, and always remembering these are long-term investments and that the knowledge you get by the investment is going to be part of the knowledge base that is uh, permanently uh, with you. Um, and I guess the only other final remark I'll make is um, a lot of the, uh, when we talk about the green transition, we talk about energy quite naturally, but it's every part of the economic uh, system. And so you have to think about systems change very broadly, transportation, energy. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I, I can't move. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, uh, systems, energy, you know, everything. And, um, the example that the two of you gave about Rose is, is a very general example. You know, uh, looking at rural roads, uh, uh, trunk roads without thinking about rural roads is obviously a mistake. And the interesting thing is we, we should have known about that. Um, in the United States, uh, in the Great Depression, we made, uh, very large investments in rural roads, including the roads that linked places to the railroads. And, and there is at least one study that has argued that that was an enormously productive investment. The reason the US grew is that, that the great, we used the time of the Great Depression to make these investments the value of which then showed up in World War II and the years afterwards. And, and those investments uh, were actually critical to the success of the United States in the war and then after the war. Yes, yes. Yes, I want to pick up one thing that uh, Joe was saying, which I think is so important. You know, um, you know we, so there's been massive improvements when it comes to, to renewables in terms of both uh, the, the functionality and, and, and the cost. But, you know, it's also when you, you know, and and, and the, the big issue is, of course, the, what you call the intermittency that is not as as um, still as reliable. But even there, you know, through battery and storage possibility, we are making progress. But I think the, the, the really big reason for doing what Joe was saying is, you know, th this is a much more flexible technology. And uh, you know, I think what what is a, a bit the problem of many of these technologies, they are not were not developed uh, primarily to serve emerging and developing countries. So, so that kind of learning and, and, and working with these advanced technologies, adjusting them to local conditions, that's a very important part. And, and if you're not, if you're not, if you are still continuing to use old style technology, you won't have that learning component. You, you, it, it's bad for you, but it's also bad for the world as a whole. And so I think that's what, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, investing and using international standards. It's very much about, we want to be part of bringing this technology into countries. And, and, and this systemic thinking that, that Theo was talking about also, I think it's in this space so important and take just the electric vehicles. You know, you need to have, think of the whole system of, you know, batteries of cars, just for a few, you know, charging stations and, and so on. And, and, and all that needs to be coordinated. It's a huge challenge for, state capacity in emerging developing countries. And you, and you won't be able to do it without participating you know, from participation from the private sector. So this to me is the, it's, it's the real challenge. How can we harness and also build state capacity?
effectively. I think there's a huge role for private sector to help the state become more effective in how, how it uh, delivers uh, on, 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 on these technologies. I just want to make two quick comments, and I, I think this is risky because I'm sitting with two much more qualified economists than myself. <laughs> I left the LSE and then I actually never worked as an economist on like these gentlemen. So, I mean, I think the question you ask also has a lot to do with the difference between the finance of the projects and the economics of the projects. And I think the, the reality, and I'm gonna to try to refrain from having my Jennifer Garner don't look up moment where I just turn red and say, oh my gosh, this is real. But um, the fact that we have been subsidizing right, the fossil fuel industry for so long, right, is, is a huge factor in keeping that cost low. And the fact that there isn't yet a tax on the bad in the form of a carbon tax that's universal um, is also a huge market failure, as it were, if you believe in the economics of climate change, which I will say I do. Um, <laughs> um, there's a lot of work that's done on that. And, you know, that the value of that varies from, you know, the $5 that we have right now in Singapore to what the social cost of carbon is, you know, which, you know, the Obama administration, I think maybe someone will correct me, it was like over $150 a ton. Well, uh, there were different The ones. Biden administration has not yet come up with the right Their answer. Uh, I've been trying to tell it what the right answer is. Okay. And it is around $125, $150. Okay. So you're all right, but they haven't quite yet gotten the message. Yeah, so if you can just imagine, I think adding that cost into how we think about project finance is going to be really critical and it's coming fast. So I, I would say that that was, um, that was the one thing that, that I wanted to share about that. And then I think the other thing was going back to resilience. So if you look at the possibilities for distributed renewables, they are massive. And the, the, the very quick case study that I would give is Houston. Um, so the, the mayor of Houston, Sylvester Turner, is the chairman of our, our board, and they went through, you know, a shock that the whole world watched when they had a blizzard and the energy grid couldn't take it. People were burning their fences in Houston, Texas to keep warm and people died. I, I mean, because they couldn't get access to water, they couldn't get access to energy in, in hospital and, and at home. So, I mean, this isn't just a, this isn't just a failure that we might have in emerging markets, right? It's a failure that we've actually entrenched so deeply <laughs> in some energy systems that you know the energy capital of the United States can't make it through a winter storm. So we have to change this. <laughs> we, ha we have to build in that equity and that resilience into our energy system. And the way that we need to do that is through changing the economics and the finance of the projects. I can't help but add, uh, a certain irony in that experience in in uh, Texas, because Texas is one of the states where the governor is a climate denier. So, so uh, a th they were punished uh, maybe by God for their uh, climate dying. <laughs> <laughs> and Ling Hai, as a Texas resident, who can testify to that. Yeah. Austin, Texas, <laughs> anyway, yeah, exactly. Exactly. It would have been even worse had they not had the wind. And uh, yes. uh, uh, yeah. yeah. So we're slowly running short of time. I know a lot of people have questions. How about we collect questions and then we invite our next keynote speaker and then we answer all that of the next keynote. So whoever has questions can raise their hand, have a quick question, comment. Rihua, you remember you had one? Uh, well, thanks all for the great uh, passionate conversation and very personal conversation and now also including uh, Professor Stieglitz. My question is back to what Professor Berglöf said earlier, that the Middle East has not been able to participate in global value chains as extensively. And you were saying that climate is actually a value proposition that they could use. And my question is actually, do you have real examples where you can, as a country, try to bring your, yourself into regional or global value chains with this proposition? Thanks. Um, just my, my question will be um, maybe from the practitioner's angles into bringing uh, solutions to the emerging world. So uh, very quickly, I, I, I'm a believer in technology and I, and, uh, and I have brought technologies and renewables to Asia. Unfortunately, where I usually end up failing is in two areas. One is around the fact that uh, um, the best technologies don't necessarily make it and win, to your point. Um, Sub-technologies are sometimes winning the bids, public bids. Um, so. And the other is around just the general awareness of the desirability solutions. So my question really is, I understand how we improve unit economics of technologies and we do it. 
how can we improve, if you will, unit economics of uh, education in these fields? That's a big problem we face in Asia. It's just if you're not going to throw your plastic uh, through the bus, it's not because someone's telling you not to do it. It's because you yourself are aware of not doing it. So that's one. That's a big issue we face. And the second has to do with um, how can we make uh, regulation more efficient? And to my point, in China, you know, we have uh, done very well on electric because at one point the government said we're phasing out this whole generation. Um, in Southeast Asia, there have not been bold steps there. So how can we make both? with education better and regulation better? How can we make the unit economics of both? That's something that from my technologist perspective, I've never really been able to harness perfectly. So we can keep it for later. It's right next to Julian. Um, so just very simple, short question. So what about catch up growth? Um, does, does each country and each region really need to re reinvent the wheel or work on the same solutions? Can a lot of countries not just wait, um, let's say, to until 2040 and then just take the technologies that other countries already produced and then, and, and, and maybe it's a very simple and naive question, but just, just um, what about just catch up growth? It's like we have, do we have like burning answers? If we do, we'll go very quickly, a round of burning answers and then turn to Bible for the keynote presentation. Yeah, let me begin with just, uh, uh, I, Part of the answer to your uh, first your question, um, one a number of countries uh, are beginning to uh, include uh, United States and 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 uh, Europe are beginning to consider uh, cross border taxes. Uh, it's very likely that U.S. will pass a cross border tax this year. I've heard a couple of the senators walking around. Um, so whether that. Yeah, uh, what that means is any country that doesn't have strong green policies is going to be punished. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can say that's an incentive, uh, both for the country and for the company. Mm -hmm. And it's an incentive for the country to de design quickly a regulatory structure and uh, to figure it out, uh, an efficient one which will entail both regulation and I think a carbon price. Uh, it'll be a mixture and public investment. Um, so uh, I, th I think uh, that is part of the, part of the answer. Uh, the other part of the uh, answer to your question, I think, uh, how do you internalize in individuals uh, uh, an awareness of uh, uh, the environment and, uh, the, you might kind of say the externalities. Uh, we're here in Switzerland and they've done a very good job of internalizing externalities about littering. Nobody litters uh, or almost nobody litters. And it's not because they're fined. It's not a regulation. Oh, they, they may be fined. It probably is a regulation. I'm sure there is, but it, it's enforced by uh, internalization, the regulation. And I think there is there has been among younger people that process of so people become more and more aware of uh, the issue of, you know, broadly saving the planet, that it has become internalized in the younger generation. And that's why they feel so strongly about these issues. So it's not perfect. And the two need to work together because you can implement regulations much more easily when most people are complying. And it's much harder when, when there, there's resistance, as uh, we've seen in the health regulations uh, in, in, in the United States. Uh, the issue you asked about uh, why not wait and catch up is, is really part of the, 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 uh, what I was addressing, trying to address when I said, uh, you pay a penalty for waiting uh, in two ways. Uh, you pay a penalty that you've uh, hitched, uh, you're paying a high cost because you're 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 wedded to an outmoded technology, and you lose the learning benefits of getting uh, uh, hitched up earlier to the new technologies. Um, it is, you know, quite frankly, it, it is an issue that on which there is uh, some controversy in economics. Uh, 
uh, it goes under the name, you know, the optimal transition. And some people say we should have a slow transition, uh, including a slow transition in prices. And I've taken the opposite view that really you, you, you ought to take a quick transition and the developing countries should not wait. Uh, but I don't want to pretend that, that, you know, not everybody agrees with me uh, on that issue. But I think the argument for uh, not being behind in technology, especially in, in countries that are growing so fast, where they have the opportunity to, to, to learn as they're doing and implement them is, is fairly compelling. Eric? No, I th so I think, you know, catch up growth. What is catch up growth? It's imitation and adaptation. And it's exactly that adaptation that I think Joe is talking about. And, and what I spoke about earlier, how you can become better at, you know, uh, uh, for example, doing renewables in individual uh, countries. So, so I think there is a, uh, you know, we, sh we need to move quickly, I think, in, in as those uh, forms of legislation or new tariffs are going to be a reality. And I, you know, my big concern is that we're going to have a, a lot of stranded assets in, in the emerging and developing world because of these, uh, because of this uh, new rule. Just on, on the quick question on, on the global value chain. So you know, I think these pressures have not so uh, been so strong until very recently. So it's probably not so easy to find very good examples. You know, the, 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 the best example to my mind is the, what's ha happening to my own country actually. So uh, uh, the, the north of Sweden used to be viewed as completely hopeless. You know, this is, we have, to, it's, it's more like uh, it's almost development assistance to, to, to have this kind of, you know, develop that part of the country. What we're seeing now is hundreds of new, uh, hundreds of thousands of new jobs being created. And it's all about uh, uh, green power and, and, and green steel. So uh, a week ago, the first uh, net zero steel was produced in, 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 in Sweden. And, uh, you know, the, uh, this is a, a, a lot of these new battery uh, producers are locating in, in the north of Sweden because they have access to, to, to green power. You see it in China, in the Yunnan province, massive movement of, uh, you know, not only driven by uh, carbon uh, considerations, maybe sometimes by cost consideration, but massive movement of uh, aluminum melters, for example, to, to, uh, to uh, Yunnan and, and uh, I can bet you that uh, Egypt, for example, which made massive investments in in uh, in uh, renewables, will benefit and will have much more opportunities to attract this kind of global value chain uh, investment. I have very three very fast things, and I'm I'm from New Jersey, so I talk very very quickly. So the first one is network around solutions, right? So aggregate solutions for appropriate problems, right? And multiple challenges at once, and then deploy them. Use technology to define where to prioritize. And I mentioned that at the beginning of my remarks, and I think we're better positioned to look at different kinds of vulnerabilities and different kinds of opportunities to solve challenges in a way that is actually more transparent than we, we have ever been. And then the third thing is actually the scope of a totally different panel, which we're not having, but I do, I do want to leave it there because I think that this group has a, a lot of um, connectivity. And I think that we have to simplify the access to catalytic capital. I think that what's really interesting, but also potentially dangerous about the proliferation of catalytic philanthropy and impact funds is that it sometimes makes it impossible for those who need innovation most to access that capital. And it turns secondary city or you know, startup <laughs> entrepreneurs into acrobats and you know, <laughs> trying to meet everyone's theory of change. So I think that the more that we can aggregate around shared outcomes with finance, with data, um, and then with proven solutions, I think the faster we can go. Fascinating. Thank you so much. And please join me in thanking all our panelists for this roundtable discussion. And let me invite Pai Bo, the founder and the CEO of uh, Metaverse Green Exchange, to give us a keynote presentation. And then we'll have the network and afternoon tea. But thank you very much. <laughs>